These individuals were intimately connected with organizations now known to have been in the pay of the United States Central Intelligence Agency, America's number one socialist. If I had been properly inquisitorial, I would have said, well, is it possible they're doing it to us? But it literally never occurred to me that they would do it. I thought it would be against their own interest and very much against the interest of what we were doing. Two student leaders. But I think the compromise here was minimal. And it was clear to me at the time that it could not be done without government money. If I had to do it over again, I believe I would do exactly the same thing. And I was very sick and disgusted, and uh, I didn't even want to see the president, who was a good friend of mine, when he came back into the room. And it felt betrayed. A labor leader. The guild has no knowledge that any of the money came from the Central Intelligence Agency or any other U.S. or other government source. No, that we and a United States the senator. Apprehensive, I found on looking over the list that I was something like a patron or an honorary member of the board of directors or something of that kind on about six or eight of the organizations that were being uh, uh, partially financed by the CIA, uh, in, in my own case, so that uh, maybe I think everybody may be somewhat corrupted uh, in consequence of, of this action and be possible to charge that I'm a front for the CIA. Lies, lies, you're telling me that you'll be true. broadcast is proof that something is seriously wrong, for whenever you hear about an intelligence operation in progress, that operation has failed. The past three weeks have seen a curious kind of domestic spy hunt, Americans exposing Americans. The magazine Rampart started it by revealing that for 15 years, the CIA has secretly financed overseas activities of the National Students Association. But then there came to light a fantastic web of CIA penetrations into other private organizations of American citizens. Tonight, we'll trace that web of CIA entanglements. Like all spy stories, this one will have its fascination. But we hope also to pose some questions for the American public to ask itself and its leaders. Questions about the atmosphere in which this 
almost comical intelligence debacle occurred. For a beginning, let's drive over to CIA headquarters. At the wheel, correspondent Roger Mudd. Every morning, the Washington motorist who flashes by this sign, BPR, along the Potomac River Parkway, is reminded of the Humpty Dumpty quote from Alice in Wonderland. When I use a word, it means just what I choose it to mean, neither more nor less. And in Washington, BPR means CIA, neither more nor less. Where are we? Where do you want to go? Why, well, we're looking for the BPR. That's over further. Make a U-turn here, go back up to the traffic light and turn right around 193. What, where am I now? Oh, uh, you, you're in a government place. Man. What is this? Well, if you don't know it, I don't have to tell. <laughs> All right. So it's not the CIA, is it? That's right. Oh, it's it right. is? Yeah. Do just, What do I do now? Just make a U-turn around this light post here and go back up to the traffic light, turn right uh, around 193. All right. Thank you. Okay. This sign symbolizes the dilemma the CIA is in how to operate a successful spy organization, but on money from a society which regards it with distaste. The result is ostracism in its most schizophrenic form. It tries to hide behind that silly green BPR marker, and yet it operates in a building well known to every local tourist guide. Its 125-acre tract was chosen because of what Alan Dulles called its isolation, topography, and heavy forestation and yet approaching airline pilots use it as a landmark. The building's original $30 million appropriation was hidden in the budget of another federal agency, and yet the CIA sent out engraved invitations for the laying of its cornerstone. Its director is called America's master spy, and yet his official stationery bears an elaborate CIA coat of arms. It is listed in the phone book under Central Intelligence Agency, but its switchboard girls answer with a mysterious Three five one 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 hundred. It is probably the world's biggest spy outfit, and yet it actually once held a press conference. Its agents lead invisible lives, and yet one of them was actually sued in open court for slander. In short, the CIA doesn't know what it is, a ruthless, hard-nosed Cold War espionage unit, or a warm, friendly, semi-democratic graduate school for scholars. But if it once decides, BPR, the good old Bureau of Public Roads might be a good cover. Roger Mudd, CBS News, Langley, Virginia. In truth, since its beginning, CIA has suffered from a personality split, for in addition to intelligence, the Security Act of 1947 ordered CIA to perform other functions and duties as directed by the President and his National Security Council. And that phrase has become a sort of blank check, authorizing CIA excursions into everything from simple propaganda to the overthrow of unfriendly governments. The key to CIA's current troubles is that unique American institution, the Tax-Free Foundation. Here is what happened. First, CIA itself set up a number of dummy foundations, calling them by impressive sounding, if meaningless names. Their sole function was to channel money from the CIA to a second kind of foundation. Now, these foundations were real, some obscure, some well-known, all involved in legitimate philanthropy. But now, in addition, they agreed to become conduits for central intelligence, mixing up the government money with their own, and then passing it on to the ever-growing list of private organizations which, during the 40s, 50s, and 60s, were climbing aboard the CIA payroll. Let's take a closer look at those legitimate foundations which became CIA payout agencies. They are among the 15,000 charitable funds that have sprung up in America in response partly to the social consciences of the rich, partly to the structure of our tax laws. They are the operative arms of what has come to be called the American establishment, the power structure of moneyed families, august law firms, prestigious universities, which have had so much influence in shaping American life and national policy since World War II. CBS newsman Norman Glubach reports on some of the foundations which channeled money for the CIA. This building is 73 Tremont Street, Boston. Just under its windows lies the historic old Granary Burial Ground, last resting place of such revolutionary patriots as Samuel Adams and Paul Revere. The building directory doesn't list it, but tax reports of the Granary Fund show its home as room 329 
which turns out to be the law firm of Hemingway and Barnes. No one there would talk before CBS news cameras about the Granary Fund, a reticence which has proved universal among the foundations. But Granary Fund reports are signed by George H. Kidder. Mr. Kidder is listed in Who's Who in America. Among his former associations, the initials CIA. Not far away, 60 State Street, home of two more CIA conduits, the Independence Foundation and the Brown Foundation. They do appear in the directory, in offices occupied by the law firm of Hale and Dorr. The late Joseph Welch, whose verbal duels with Senator Joseph McCarthy helped end McCarthy's career and his era, was a partner here. Paul Helmuth, trustee of both foundations, wouldn't see us or even come to the phone. For many years, CIA's financial secrets were safe with men and firms of such discretion as these. But suddenly, a new state law required foundations to publish their income and outgo. Now, under the golden dome of the state house lay the whole CIA story, just awaiting anyone who wanted to dig into the Attorney General's files. Those files had become a time bomb, yet CIA never tried to defuse them by changing its operations. There, even today, you can see the Independence Foundation's 1964 payments to NSA and its president, Dennis Shaw, who knew of and still defends the CIA involvement. You can see that the Granary Fund in 1965 received $650,000 from three CIA dummies, transmitting the money to such beneficiaries as the John Hay Whitney Trust and the Retail Clerks International Association. Perhaps you wonder why it has become so easy for the press to ferret out CIA's financial shenanigans. This is the 1964 statement of the Sidney and Esther Rabb Foundation. Mr. Rabb was among the many philanthropists involved in CIA transactions who preferred not to talk with CBS News. For 1964, the Rabb Fund had only three cash contributions. Everything else came from its own securities. But three known CIA dummies contributed $25,000, $20,000, and $6,000. Remember those sums. These are the RAB Fund's benefactions for 1964. $16.66 to Brandeis University, $3 to the Businessmen's Council, and so on, until we come to $25,000 for the International Development Foundation. Then some more modest donations, then $20,000 to the Society of African Culture, then $2 to Sinai Hospital, and $6,000 to the National Students Association. In effect, the CIA has once again been caught trying to hide an edifice the size of the Pentagon behind a little sign that says, Bureau of Public Roads. In a moment, we'll meet some of the people who were getting that CIA money. Do you remember the East Berlin Youth Festival of 1951? and 26,000 young people from 104 countries massed to salute the heroic North Korean army for its struggle against the American imperialist aggressors. And when Harry Truman showed up on propaganda posters as a brand new Adolf Hitler. Or do you remember the Moscow extravaganza of 1957? 100,000 young people, many of them future leaders of Africa, Asia, and Latin America gathering at the fountainhead of communism to celebrate such gala occasions as Hiroshima Day and Anti-Colonialism Day. For six successive youth festivals, the Kremlin did all of the talking and the people who paid for the fireworks made sure they turned out the proper shade of red. But then something changed in Vienna in 1959. Here is how CBS News correspondent Ernest Leiser described it then. The Seventh World Youth Festival was anything but an unqualified success for its Soviet sponsors. They ran a calculated risk in holding it outside their own area of control, and the risk did not pay off well. The festival met challenge for the first time, and the communists did not know how to deal with that novel experience. It did not strike either the resonant sounding board in the free world that the communists hoped. Instead, the festival ran smack up against indifference. The anti-communist opponents of the festival were not al altogether successful either. They raised the challenge, but their own program was small and scattershot. Against massive Soviet organization, their own disorganized half-effort was not enough. But this was their first try. 
And it did demonstrate very clearly that if the West went all out, it could effectively take over the World Youth Festival any time it comes out of Russia's area of control. The person most responsible for that first partial scatter-shot Western success at the Vienna Festival was a young student leader named Gloria Steinem. Her independent research service helped bring those freewheeling young Americans to Vienna. Now Ms. Steinem reveals that her work at Vienna and later at the Helsinki Youth Festival of 1962 was secretly paid for by the Central Intelligence Agency. And in fact, somewhere amid that tangle of CIA philanthropies, you'll find a 1962 Independence Foundation grant to the Independent Research Service for $125,000. What did it buy us? A few days ago, Gloria Steinem and correspondent Marvin Kalb, who covered the Helsinki Festival, sat down to see that communist extravaganza again on CBS News Film. How well organized was their operation? Oh, well, very well organized. I mean, this is, this is a Soviet-run festival, and it's the result of two years of preparation, uh, very careful planning, uh, putting together delegations all over the world. But would these people have known that they were part of some great big communist uh, operation at this point? Yes, I think so. I think it was quite evident. Oh, yes, this is Jerry Pelican, Pelican who's representative of the age of communist students one gets. The last three people who have occupied his position have been Soviets who have gone immediately to being head of the Soviet Secret Service. So Including you, people like Shelyepin and yes, Samish Chastin. Yes, exactly. So you can see how, um, how shall I say, amateurish the, <laughs> the communist students are. Was it basically Russian money that brought a lot of these delegations to Helsinki? Uh, yes, in, in many cases it was. But what's the thumbs down? What was that all about? Oh, that's, uh, those are the Finnish students who uh, did not wish the festival to come there in the first place. That doesn't look like too enthusiastic a crowd, does it? <laughs> Gloria, here's the American delegation coming through. How many of these people were aware of, uh, of any kind of CIA funding of their, of their presence? Or... No, none, none. They were all, uh, they came because they believed that it was important to come and represent the diversity of American views at the festival where, after all, uh, many Asians and Africans and Latin Americans had gathered. No one, they were not, never told what to say. Uh, after all, it's not very impressive or a proof of freedom to present one monolith with another, and uh, there was no, no attempt to do so. Is this your jazz group? Yes, we encouraged them to come. I believe they had other concerts uh, to do in Europe as well, but uh, uh, we asked them to come to Helsinki. Uh, there was an art ex exhibition there, Now what this, is happening here? This, uh, this happened two or three nights in a row at the beginning of the Yeah, festival. I think, I th as I remember, it was four nights all together before it was finally quelled. The, the uh, Finnish young people were so drastically against the festival that they did something which I thought was unwise, which is to demonstrate violently against it. As a result, there was Soviet pressure on the Finnish government to, uh, to quell the demonstrations, and they did. They used tear gas against their own students in order to to do it. You had nothing to do with uh, No, nothing at all. We, we, no, we advised against it. We thought not, violence was a mistake in any case. Gloria, at the festival, you worked for the Independent Research Service. That's um, right. Well, exactly when did your own association with the CIA start, and in what fashion? Did they come to in, you, or did you go to them? In 1958, when I came home from, from India. I discussed with student leaders, past and present, uh, many of them active with the National Student Association, uh, this kind of small foundation to encourage Americans to go. They thought it was a good idea, too. I was then told by foundations and professors and friends that, it, that I should not do this, that I would get in trouble with the House on American Activities Committee, the American Legion, uh, all of those 50s people. Uh, and I became convinced that it was impossible. 
it was at that point that the student leaders said to me that they had in the past received funds for international programs from the CIA and that they felt that this was important and could also be partly funded by the CIA. Well, I mean, did you feel that you really tried? I mean, did you go around to all of the wealthy found mm -hmm. private foundations, uh, wealthy private people, and, and explain your point of view and, and explain why you felt it was important that the United States be represented at these things in a certain way? What did they tell you? Uh, they told me that, well, the Ford Foundation, for instance, told me that they thought it, we were uh, too liberal and too controversial and that we would endanger their cultural programs in Austria. I mean, the first festival was being held in Vienna. It was not encouraging at all. And the, the private individuals to whom I went uh, often had uh, particular points of view to put forward, which would have been much, much more restricting than, than uh, the CIA funds were, which were free. I mean, no one was told what to say. What do you mean they were free? You mean to say it was easier for you to work for the CIA than a private That's organization? That's right. That's right. And, and the, the reason I think that comes as a surprise, as it did to me at the time, I mean, I had uh, the conventional liberals' view of the CIA as a right-wing incendiary group. And I was amazed to discover that this was far from the case, that they were enlightened, liberal, nonpartisan activists of the sort who characterized the Kennedy administration, for instance. You have not been working now uh, uh, for the CIA since 1962. Mm. Uh, you still criticize. Uh, you were down oh, recently yes. in Washington. <laughs> yes, when the, when the story broke that I had once been, that I had for four years been a central intelligence agent I was demonstrating outside the Pentagon underneath Mr. McNamara's office against bombing in Vietnam. And uh, this didn't precisely fit with the image of a CIA agent, but then neither does the CIA. Gloria Steinem, activist who sees the CIA as a sort of enlightened pal or rich uncle, quietly bankrolling worthy projects. There is another viewpoint. The young man who sprang the leak that led to the Rampart's disclosure is Philip Sherburne. He learned the secret while an NSA vice president, then won the presidency last year, determined, he says, to break the CIA connection. In his first television interview, Philip Sherburn recounts the circumstances of his first being made witty, NSA jargon for those who knew the CIA secret. President of the NSA in uh, 1965, uh, while I was National Affairs Vice President, uh, asked me to go to Washington with him to uh, look at some potential sites for a building for NSA's uh, expected move to Washington, D.C. And that was uh, in May of 65. We uh, went to a motel to meet with two former NSA people who were going to give us some assistance in looking for a building site in Washington. And after some discussion, the president of the association at that time excused himself. Uh, and I then was alone with the two former officers, the staff persons from NSA. And we discussed uh, the financial situation of NSA for a brief while, and then they told me that there were some things that I should know about the finances of NSA and its history, which I was not aware of at that time, and that I needed to know in order to fulfill my functions uh, properly within the organization. And at that time, uh, one of them uh, reached into his pocket and pulled out a security agreement and gave it to me, and I read it, uh, and they asked me to sign it and notice that they might tell me the, uh, uh, the story which I had not yet heard. And so I told them that I really didn't want to sign that agreement, and they said that it was really no problem, that most of the people, uh, officers of NSA had signed it in the past, and that they really did need to tell me something which I didn't know. And so I signed the agreement, and then they said that there had been an amicable uh, relationship between the government and NSA for a long time and that NSA had really survived and been able to grow and expand its international program only by the good graces of the federal government and, in particular, the Central Intelligence Agency. And then I was very sick and disgusted, and uh, I didn't even want to see the president, who was a good friend of mine, when he came back into the room, and it felt betrayed. I think that Senator Jackson called it, if we hadn't gone along, at the, in the climate of the time, in the effort to, to get some kind of a force to combat 
the student forces of the communist bloc, that we would have, uh, I think he called it unilateral political disarmament. Is there no truth? Is there no truth in what he says? In the first argument uh, that Congress would never have approved, that sort of support, uh, that seems to me to indicate that uh, those people who felt that this was the right sort of approach overseas were not willing to make a public debate or go to the Congress or to the people in order to try and get support for this kind of a program overseas. Uh, that seems to me in the long run to be an extremely detrimental policy to the government of the United States. Now let's move a good deal further ahead. When they knew all about what you knew and what you were about to say, what did the CIA do to try to keep you from talking? Well, of course, there's a first uh, uh, means, I suppose, of keeping you from talking, and that is that if you've signed a security agreement, uh, you're aware that uh, the public disclosure of classified information uh, is a violation of the National Security Act, and such a violation uh, can be met with criminal prosecution. And the other pressures uh, were primarily persuasion, uh, simply discussing in great detail what kinds of consequences would flow to other individuals, other organizations, students overseas, as a result of the uh, allegations being confirmed. There has been talk of changing students' draft status, of forging students' psychiatric records. To your certain knowledge, is there any truth in that? Uh, to my knowledge, that is untrue, uh, and I think is a projection of some people's image of what they think the agency is and the kinds of things that it might likely do uh, to people. The story began with students, but then it spread until what became astonishing was the sheer diversity of CIA's interests. Its funds were traced to the National Council of Churches, to book publisher Frederick Prager, to half a dozen colleges. And then came what may be the biggest involvement of all, organized labor. George Meany insists his AFL-CIO hasn't taken one thin dime from the CIA, but some individual unions were taking. The American Newspaper Guild, as you saw at the beginning of this broadcast, denied that it knowingly received CIA money. But a million dollars flowed to it through such conduits as the Granary Fund. The Retail Clerks Union apparently got CIA funds. And the most startling story of all concerns a Latin American revolution. British Guiana, 1963, under the far left, rabidly anti-U.S. regime of Chetty Jagan. A series of strikes, then riots, pitched battles in the streets, ultimately the downfall of the Jagan government, its replacement by a regime more friendly to Washington. Helping to organize those strikes, two CIA men actually operating out of the Washington headquarters of the American Federation of State, County, and Municipal Employees. The labor operation, which yielded perhaps the most questionable result, was CIA's funding in the Dominican Republic of the Institute of International Labor Research. Its chairman, Socialist Norman Thomas. On the board, Supreme Court Justice William Douglas, from whom we'll hear later. Both Mr. Thomas and Justice Douglas now insist they had no idea of the CIA connection. What caused the uproar, however, is that CIA apparently wound up financing a propaganda attack on United States policy. Richard Threlkeld asked Norman Thomas about the incident. Mr. Thomas, what was the Institute in Santo Domingo and what did it do? The Institute was an educational venture which was trying to expand itself. It was primarily intended to take earnest young men who had had no experience and no education that would make them good people for secretaries, the cooperatives of labor unions, and what have you. Do you think the CIA got a fair return for the money it put into your project? Well, I don't know what the CIA could do. You'd have to ask them. I tell you that I kept getting reports uh, up here in the United States from Santa Domingo that the CIA was working against us all the time on the field. And that's what made me the more surprised. I tell you, our man had to, had to hide out as a suspected communist for a day or two. You mentioned a, a pamphlet that you put out with, in effect, CIA money. Well, uh, I, I suppose CIA money. It was certainly what was the residue of the uh, money that we got from the capital fund. Well, we did have some thousands left. And by this time, uh, the United States had intervened in the Santa Domingo, to a thing to which we were opposed. And I got out a pamphlet collecting various newspaper and other articles 
in a very strong attack on our intervention. And we had enough money to circulate that to Congress and the newspapers throughout the United States pretty generally. It was a kind of an ironic thing. When we did it, I still wasn't sure it was, uh, I didn't think that was necessarily CIA. I thought it was, uh, what should we call it, Kaplan Fund money. Were you but aware? I would, uh, it, I'd rather take satisfaction that it was CIA money. We'll be back in a moment with a story of a CIA operation which may have used you as its cover. In the pay of the CIA, an American dilemma will continue after this break for station identification. In the pay of the CIA, an American dilemma. Here again is CBS News correspondent Mike Wallace. Now we come to the strangest of CIA's penetrations into private groups, a project which in effect used you, the individual American, as cover. It went like this. Young people in communist countries, shouldn't they hear both sides? Radio Free Europe needs your support. If you responded to the many appeals for Radio Free Europe on television, in magazines, even on buses and subways, then you became part of a CIA cover. Correspondent Hughes Rudd. Since the CIA is involved in so many other things, it's probably not surprising to learn that they're also in the broadcasting business and in a pretty big way. This transmitter outside of Munich is aimed at a vast transmitter complex outside of Lisbon, Portugal, which in turn is aimed at Poland, Hungary, Romania, Czechoslovakia, and Bulgaria. The operation is called Radio Free Europe, and as the sign at the office in Munich says, Radio Free Europe is made possible by American donations. That's true enough, but the overwhelming majority of those donations come from the Central Intelligence Agency. In theory, all the budget comes from private donations, but that budget amounts to some $14 million a year, which is asking a lot even of big-hearted anti-communists. Mówi rozgłośnia Polska, radia wolna Europa. Mandelsztę mu w żywotopis, aż do doby jego prvního zatčení. Chiar și lumânările, care art foarte decorativ, pe mesele din restaurant. Műsorunkat éjfélig, azaz 24 óráig sugározzuk a következő hullámsáv beosztás szerint. O Sventuva Radio Svobodna Evropa predava vsaka sutrin. Radio Free Europe, or RFE, broadcasts some 19 hours a day in the languages of its five target countries. Polish, Czech, Romanian, Hungarian, and Bulgarian. Most of the broadcasts are devoted to news and to commentary about the news, news which the various communist bloc regimes suppress at home. RFE estimates some 20 million listeners in the five countries, and in addition to news and commentary, they get American popular music, sometimes with a sort of inadvertent plea for credibility. RFE not only talks, it listens. Specialists monitor broadcasts from its five target countries as well as the Soviet Union, East Germany, and Albania. The staff reads dozens of newspapers and magazines from the satellite countries and puts out news reports based on them, as well as background material for scholars, governments, and reporters. The director of Radio Free Europe in Munich is Chester Ott, a retired United States Army colonel from Portland, Oregon. Well, Mr. Ott, what's the purpose of uh, Radio Free Europe? Well, that's a pretty big question, uh, Mr. Rudd. Our purpose, in a general way, is to promote the freedom of the people who live in our the countries to which we broadcast, and the freedom of those countries as countries. Would you say that uh, Radio Free Europe is trying to overthrow the regimes in those Soviet bloc countries? No, no. Uh, this, again, to change the question just a little bit, this leads me to think of, of uh, as you might have asked, if we incite, try to incite people to up to uh, rise up against their governments. No, of course we don't do that. Again, it would be immoral, reprehensible, even criminal of us to encourage people to, to uh, uh, riot or to try to overthrow their governments. We 
work for evolution toward freedom, not for revolution. Colonel Ott did not wish to discuss the CIA's connection with RFE, nor did anyone else in the organization, although it's been an open secret for years that CIA money was behind the operation. The employees maintain in public that they are supported by those private contributions, and they have some strong character witnesses. President Eisenhower, for instance, said that the uh, Radio Free Europe is a private enterprise which serves the cause of freedom with truth and power. President Kennedy said, I urge my fellow citizens to contribute generously in order to ensure that Radio Free Europe's valuable work continues with full effectiveness. And President Johnson said, to perform its task, Radio Free Europe needs the continued support of American citizens. Hughes Rudd, CBS News, Munich. The CBS television network says it is now restudying its policy on public service announcements for Radio Free Europe. The network has broadcast no such announcements since February 15th. An NBC spokesman said that network will continue to give time to Radio Free Europe as long as the practice is supported by the Advertising Council. ABC had no comment. The Advertising Council said that its campaign on behalf of Radio Free Europe is over for 1967, and the question of future campaigns will be taken up next fall. Now, in the story of the CIA Foundation caper, we come to the question, what next? As soon as the story broke, President Johnson ordered a halt to all CIA student subsidies Though within the past few days, another young NSA officer resigned, charging the group still has not made a complete break with the CIA. Other officers deny the charge. President Johnson also appointed Under Secretary of State Nicholas Katzenbach, Welfare Secretary John Gardner, and CIA Director Richard Helms to study CIA's new troubles. The tone of that crucial study, due shortly, may have been tipped by an interim report submitted by Mr. Katzenbach and immediately endorsed by the President. It said, the support provided by the CIA enabled many far-sighted and courageous Americans to serve their country in time of challenge and danger. It is vitally important that the current controversy not be permitted to obscure the value nor impede the effectiveness of competent and dedicated career officials serving this country. Yet the administration is not speaking with one voice about CIA. Just two days before the Katzenbach defense Vice President Humphrey, speaking at Stanford University, sounded a different note about CIA's involvement with students. Well, this is one of the saddest times that uh, our government has had in reference to public policy. My own view is that these organizations ought to be free and independent. I regret that they were unable to be that way. I'm not at all happy about what the CIA has been doing. And I'm sure that out of this uh, very singularly disagreeable situation will come a reformation of that agency with closer, su closer supervision of its activities and with recommendations coming to the government of the United States that will confine the CIA to its intelligence gathering purposes and to keep it from being associated directly or indirectly with uh, organizations and bodies of men and women and young people that, uh, do, that are not needed for those purposes. If the administration is speaking with more than just one voice, the Congress is speaking with many. Roger Mudd with some hints as to the legislative outcome of the latest CIA muddle. Mention the CIA to the average congressman and he will either dodge your question or profess his ignorance. But mention the CIA and academic freedom in the same breath and that hill will explode with reaction. The most extreme criticism came from Senator Wayne Morse, the Oregon Democrat. Let me say to this administration, the CIA is one of the major causes for the development of this great credibility chasm that's developed within American public opinion. And you can't bridge it now. You can't bridge it now unless this administration makes perfectly clear it's going to fill the chasm with the truth. My charge, Mr. Mudd, is that the CIA has corrupted the stream of truth, objectivity, and academic learning in this country. And it must be removed from all activities except the very limited activity 
what we know as intelligence activity in the field of spying and espionage and counter-espionage. From Senator Eugene McCarthy, Democrat of Minnesota, came words more softly expressed but equally critical. But there are some people whom you shouldn't use, it seems to me, under certain circumstances, and there are some organizations, especially student groups, which I think, unless you feel the republic is about to fall, really, and church groups, uh, that you really ought not to begin to use churchmen or students or church organizations uh, or student organizations as instruments for espionage or as instruments for advancing uh, uh, what, we, what we would call, if the Russians were doing it, official government propaganda. And I see no indication that there was, whoever was making these decisions for the CIA uh, has not yet indicated that, that uh, he, he was really very sensitive as to the point at which he, he went beyond that which was acceptable. I think there was a little bit of empire building within the agency on, on this. Somebody down there must have begun to think he was in the Ford Foundation. The main defense of the CIA was made by Democrat John Stennis of Mississippi, a member of the Senate's CIA watchdog subcommittee. Was the CIA's entrance, uh, in your opinion, was its entrance into the field of public opinion perhaps a little unwise, do you think? Well, I it might have gone further than I would have gone if I had been in on making the judgments directly. Uh, this, this originated in the early 50s. You remember, that's when the Congress was passing here the bill that outlawed the Communist Party, for instance. There was a congressional expression of need. And uh, 17 years later, the, the courts uh, got around finally to... Uh, almost emasculated, but that was the atmosphere of the times. Now, uh, as the years come and go, emphasis had to be changed, I think, and uh, perhaps in some of these programs, they didn't change it fast enough. But this is quite serious business. We can't do without it. Uh, we must continue it, and I frankly think, uh, I hope at least we'll quit talking about it so much uh, soon, and the people realize, American people realize that this is something different. The word has already been passed on the Hill, passed from the leadership and from that inner, inner group of men who watch over the CIA. The result is that Congress will do virtually nothing publicly to investigate or reform the agency. The reasoning is this, the publicity already has destroyed the CIA's program of triple pass subsidies so that even the most extreme critics regard additional exposure as pointless. What the leadership now hopes is that the CIA will recognize that times have changed and will change itself accordingly. Roger Mudd, CBS News, Capitol Hill. Will CIA change? From what to what? As usual, the agency refuses all comment, but a longtime leader of the agency is now a private citizen. And Alan Dulles agreed to break his silence on the CIA's current troubles. He was interviewed by CBS News correspondent George Herman. First question, wasn't the covert use of students in particular a tactical error for CIA? Well, I wouldn't admit that and in the light of the uh, important objectives that uh, one had. Uh, after all, it seemed uh, likely at the, that time uh, that if nothing if, uh, was done, that the communists would take over the international student movement. And that would have been very serious. And uh, I think, therefore, one was justified, one can differ on this, but I think one was justified in taking the risk uh, of doing what was done, that is, uh, uh, helping students to go to these meetings, to attend these meetings, to express their views there. Uh, there's very much too much talked about that they were used as spies. They weren't used as spies. Uh, they may have brought certain information back about what the communists were trying to do with the student movement, things of that kind. But that was not their principal function, or was it a principal function? No, that was not the principal function. The principal function was to, to openly express uh, the free American viewpoint in these student meetings. Did you have any idea how much of a splash it would make when it finally came out that the students were involved? How sensitive an issue it was? Well, I don't believe so. Uh, but um, 
As I say, if you stop always and think of all the consequences of all the actions you take, you do nothing. This wasn't a world in which one could do nothing. It wasn't a do-nothing world. It was a, a, a world in those days, 48 on, though, for several years along there, when you had to do something and do it rapidly. We had to do something, says the man who perhaps more than anyone else made CIA what it is today. But there is a deep question about whether in defending America, CIA crossed a line America should not cross. Supreme Court Justice William Douglas talks with Martin Nagronsky. I have always felt that the great strength of America was not in her bombs or her guns or her armies, but in the uh, free flow of ideas, the uh, freedom of people to think and believe and speak and advocate as they like, to travel uh, freely, to represent any point of view that they, they want, and to be beholden to no one, to be a spy or, for no one, or a secret agent for no one. And <clears throat> this kind of practice that has been disclosed destroys that uh, uh, image, uh, impairs greatly the usefulness of Americans traveling abroad. Mr. Dulles, how would you appraise the damage done by the disclosure in the recent months of all these activities? One can only really do that when one has a historical view of it. Uh, I would say that it was harmful seriously harmful but not fatal i think the agency will be able to to go on do its work uh, but uh, i i think that certainly for a time uh, this publicity uh, is going to be harmful to it and to the country and therefore to the country directly to the country and that it hurts the image of American democracy as free and unsecret and uh, uh, frank and open with all the world? Well, I don't know if it affects the question of freedom so much, but uh, uh, it will, uh, it will uh, uh, make efforts along the lines of the, uh, see, of the student movement and uh, other movements uh, it'll make efforts along those lines more difficult. Mr. Justice, in a free society, as you know, there is a conflict constantly between the demands of national security and those of freedom. Do you feel that this, perhaps, is an instance of that? Of course, uh, there's only... Real security can come only in a, in a full-fledged police state, and everybody is secure. Everybody knows where everybody else is and what he stands for, and, and if he doesn't stand for the right things, then there's a place to put, put him away. Uh, and our, uh, our security is built in just the opposite, not by regimentation, but by trusting people, <coughs> by having uh, big public debates and, and, and arguments, letting people stand for anything across the spectrum of ideas that, that they want to, and then letting the majority of the people decide which way they want to go. That's America. And uh, as long as uh, we have uh, full disclosure, uh, I think we can, we can develop great security. The insecurity, I think, comes uh, <coughs> with secret operations because then people don't know eventually whom to trust, whom to believe, who stands for what. And so you get a gradual loss of confidence and integrity in government, and that is very disastrous in a free society. Mr. Dulles, you've been a, a servant of the United States and of the United States government in many places and for a long time. Do you feel at all that by using covert methods to advance this open exchange of ideas between American students and foreign students, do you feel you were undermining the whole theory of, the, of what America is about, as some have charged? No. Uh, no, I don't, uh, I don't feel that. Uh, if you were in a certain kind of a ball game or a boxing match, uh, there are certain rules that you, uh, that you uh, follow. Uh, where you're in a battle, uh, when secret activities are being mounted against you, uh, you can't advertise all the time your countermeasures. Now, those countermeasures are 
perfectly proper if you're going to defend yourself. You feel that in operating in this way, we are, in effect, aping the communists? Yes, this is a totalitarian method. Everybody knows that a man from a communist country comes here. He's paid by the Politburo. He speaks for the Politburo. He acts for the Politburo. He has no independent views unless perhaps he gets way off in a corner somewhere and talks to you very privately. But all of his public appearances are, are, are official. And that slows down the effectiveness of those regimes. It makes them largely impotent. It doesn't give them the vitality that we have. You don't feel that uh, in using such covert methods you were really adopting the enemy's own battleground and thus losing a little something? Well, I don't say we adopted the same kind of techniques. Uh, they were trying to destroy, we were trying to build. Now, it seems to me uh, uh, when, uh, uh, when you're meeting a fellow that's trying to destroy, uh, you have to employ uh, the, uh, uh, the techniques uh, that are appropriate for that situation. And uh, you generally have to, to succeed in a battle, uh, you generally have to use the element of surprise if you can, and the element of surprise requires a certain amount of secrecy. You are, you have been, I guess you'd call it, uh, to use the cliché, a master spy. Well, I don't like that title particularly. But uh, do you've been elbow deep in this work of espionage. Do you feel despicable? Do you feel that you've been a, a leader of sneaky people? Not or in the least. What do you feel? And I can say the men that I worked with, I have the greatest admiration for. I have a fine, as fine a group of men and women, because you don't forget the women in this, uh, that one could find. Do you feel apologetic about the work that you've Never. been doing? Never. How do you feel about it? What, what was its I value? I feel it was essential. I feel it was necessary. It's a question of, of uh, <coughs> reorienting ourselves on our constitutional philosophy and making up our minds we're going to operate as, as a free society and we're going to make uh, <clears throat> no, put, put no uh, leashes on anybody, uh, let Americans go wherever they want to go uh, <clears throat> and not load them down with secret missions and, and retainers, uh, <clears throat> but let them go as individuals representing the great powerful spiritual force of America, which after all is in diversity and not in spreading propaganda. Would you feel then that the benefits that we would get from the CIA operating in this way, the security benefits, <clears throat> are not worth the damage that is done to our free society? I think the damage is, is incalculable, and I can't imagine that there would be any benefits that could possibly offset it. It was necessary, says Alan Dulles. It was wrong, says Justice Douglas. In the 40s and the 50s, men in power in our government decided that the Cold War was indeed a war, demanding wartime measures of secrecy and deception. And so they took it on themselves to suspend the rules of this free society. Given the political climate then, and their doubt that they could obtain the necessary money openly through Congress, still the question inevitably follows. Why, when the wartime emergency diminished, why did the CIA or its watchdogs fail to terminate the measures they had taken? And why did the human instruments they used not insist on re-establishing their independence of the CIA? Were they subtly corrupted by the money and the power made available to them, unwilling to acknowledge that they were in the process of becoming, in the words of a current film, Russians with creases in their pants? Most of the attention and most of the disappointment that have stemmed from the revelations of the past month have been focused on the National Students Association and its officers. America has always had a special faith in the incorruptibility of its youth, which makes doubly suspect the manipulations by the leaders of the NSA. There hasn't been a World Youth Festival since 1962. The next one is scheduled for the communist country of Bulgaria in 1969. Certainly this country will be represented there. To fail to show up would be an abdication. But should a tainted NSA be the instrument of our presence, and will the Congress now acknowledge the desirability of sending a delegation, even if its views are different from their own? Or should those funds come from private sources? As we begin to resolve these questions, we begin to redefine the role and the responsibility of the free voice in the free society, in competition with the controlled voice of the closed society. 
It is no exaggeration to say the world will be watching our performance in Bulgaria in 1969. Good night. This has been a CBS News special report in the pay of the CIA, An American Dilemma, with CBS News correspondent Mike Wallace. This broadcast was produced under the supervision and control of CBS News.